Welcome to the uh, Environmental Law Institute. Uh, I'm John Pendergrass, Vice President for Programs and Publications at uh, ELI. You've joined us for our Basics of the Clean Water Act, uh, part of uh, ELI's summer school series. And uh, very happy to have everyone who is here in person, uh, but also uh, joining us uh, via webinar. Um, and uh, I uh, encourage you to follow our um, events page on uh, our website, eli.org, um, for future events, particularly the uh, continuing uh, series, uh, summer school series, um, and for uh, on the for the members uh, that are on the go-to webinar, um, we encourage you to uh, ask questions, um, and you can do so in the uh, question box on GoTo. Um, and for those of you uh, on the webinar, you don't need to hold them when you, as soon as you have a question. Uh, go ahead and um, put it into the uh, question box, and um, then they'll be queued up for us. Um, we really appreciate getting questions both from the audience in, in the room, but also those on the uh, webinar. We will have um, microphones for those of you in the audience. Um, these are not um, there so that people in the uh, webinar can uh, hear you, they don't amplify, just like the one that I'm wearing is is for them to be able to hear. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, our wonderful uh, panel um, for being here today to, to teach the basics of the Clean Water Act. Um, this will be recorded. It'll be available along with the PowerPoints um, within the next week. Um, and. Uh, I encourage you to uh, look at the full speaker bios that are on our, uh, the website. Um, but uh, briefly, um, joining us uh, remotely, we have uh, Elizabeth Andrews, uh, professor of the practice of law at, um, and director of the Virginia Coastal Policy Center at the Marshall Wythe School of Law, College of William and Mary. Um, and uh, Kathy Robb, principal at Cy Paget and Rizal, um, both uh, will be online. So thank you both. And in the room um, next to me, David Lastra, Regional Criminal Enforcement Council, uh, EPA Region Three, and Amanda Waters, General Counsel at the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. Um, thank you both for you. Uh, being here with us. Um, so with that, we'll start with uh, David. All right, thank you. Um, again, my name is David Lastra, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to the Environmental Law Institute for having me here. Um, I was actually, I'm actually substituting for a colleague of mine who was unfortunately not able to join today. Um, the presentation that you will see is his, uh, but all the credit goes to me, and you know, I'm always starting to get credit for somebody else's. It's kind of, it's kind of, kind of fun. Um, um, I don't know how many of you know this, but the EPA has a criminal investigation division that uh, investigates crimes. Uh, we have about 100 and change agents nationwide. That's a very small place, but it was a very small community. Uh, but we do exercise our discretion to investigate uh, and refer cases to the Department of Justice. That's what I do. I'm not an investigator. I'm an attorney that supports the criminal investigation division. Um, it's a fun job. It's a, an incredible opportunity to protect the environment. Um, the criminal investigation division, of course, is dealing with the most egregious violations. Uh, a great part of my job is dealing with the Clean Water Act, uh, do enforcement. Uh, the presentation is more of an overview, so I'm gonna give you an overview of the act, but I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the enforcement side, which I think is kind of fun. Uh, I would say that the Clean Water Act is probably one of our most powerful statutes. Uh, if you are thinking about violating the law in terms of the environment, I would advise you not to do it, uh, <laughs> not to do, you know, mess up with the water. Uh, it's interesting because humanity has this incredible affinity for water. Uh, we all love it. We all like to swim, recreate fish. Um, and I think that's part of sort of the reasons why we have such a powerful statue. We'll talk a little bit about 
the history, how it was created. Um, and again, this would be more basics. If uh, anybody have questions about it, please, uh, you can interrupt me now or while I'm doing the presentation or write your questions and we'll address them at the end, okay? So having said that, um, and that's me. All right, again, this presentation, I have to read this. <laughs> Uh, it's an informal overview of the Clean Water Act and the slides are not intended as a formal statement of the position of the EPA or the United States. I'm required to say that even though I'm here basically in my official capacity. Um, I am an attorney, I represent the agency. Uh, it's a great job, I, am, I really enjoy it. Um, and you'll get to see some of that. <laughs> so how do we start? Uh, so particularly in the area of enforcement, this is one of the critical uh, things that you will learn today. What is the objective of the statute? Why is it that we created the Clean Water Act? This is gonna be our focus throughout all the slides, throughout all the, all the things that we're gonna be talking about today. I can tell you that they are based on this particular objective, which is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Now we'll see how that relates to water quality standards, to criteria, to anti-degradation policies. So how do we address that as a effective and more practical? We'll address it a little bit, but this is sort of your aim. If um, I think one of the important lessons here is what is it the objective? And that's gonna be uh, your focus when you're dealing with cases regarding the Clean Water Act. And if you see particularly in indictments or complaints that the EPA files against individuals or corporations, this is one of the first allegations. So you may have an allegation about jurisdiction. The second or third allegation is going to be what is the objective of the Clean Water Act because that's our focus. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, this is sort of the structure, how we divide into chapters. Uh, it's called titles. If you look at the um, codified version of the Clean Water Act, you, we're talking about section 309, for example, or 304 or 302 uh, in the Title word will be 33 USC section 1301. Let's go back to that one. So you see the codification that will be under the chapter 33, uh, the US code section 1251 is the first one. And you go from there all the way. Uh, we typically in the in the practical world, we use the, the US code sections uh, instead of, you know, you will see in some, some of the slide, what is section 302, you will need to look at section 311, I believe, or 312, 1312, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, going back to the subchapters, the first one addresses sort of policy, how to do research, uh, what are the program grants. Um, the second chapter was a big chapter early on in the environmental world, in the Clean Water Act world, the construction grants for POTWs. That has been phased out and is now what we call the subchapter uh, six, which is the SRF, and I'll talk about that in, in a second. Uh, the standards and enforcement is what I do most of the time, enforcement um, of this, stat, this you know, particular provisions of the Clean Water Act. Permits and licenses, I think Amanda's going to talk about. Uh, and then, of course, we always refer back to the general definitions, like what are waters of the United States, which are not necessarily well defined in the, in the statute what is a point source, what is a non-point source, discharge, uh, what are pollutants, um, and I can tell you in the Clean Water Act, a pollutant is basically anything that is something other than water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you're discharging water, that's not a pollutant. If it's you're discharging anything, even water that is uh, warm, you know, at a certain degree, or water has a particular pH, or oil, or sewage, those are all pollutants. So it's a very strong, um, very, um, helpful, I would say, definition of pollutants. Uh, we'll address some of the other definitions that are uh, more problematic later. All right, questions about that? Just a, the general structure. All right, so how did we start? So it's neat because the first environmental statue in the United States was the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. Uh, it actually has criminal provisions, as you um, might be surprised. In fact, I have prosecuted several individuals using the uh, Rivers and Harbors Act. It's still good law. Um, it carries a mandatory um, term of incarceration of 30 days, which is unusual for somebody uh, to 
address that. They are thinking, wait a second. And one of the neat things about it is strict liability. So if you um, mess up with the Rivers and Harbors Act, and we can prove that you uh, did it, and we'll talk a little bit about what it, what is uh, what it constitutes. Uh, a violation of the Rivers and Harbors Act. But the neat thing about it is that it was the first environmental law statute. It does provide for criminal, it's a misdemeanor. Uh, so it carries a term of incarceration of up to a year, but it does, there's a term in the statute that reads a minimum term of 30 days. And I have actually been successful in doing that. So has EPA and other contexts. Uh, from there we go to 1965, which was the first uh, water quality, it was the first federal water pollution statute uh, that address that directly the water quality standards directly it really did not have that much teeth it wasn't that um, useful in terms of enforcement it's not until 1972 that we talk about the more critical aspects of the clean water act which are uh, pollution the discharge and dealing with pollution discharges right that starts in uh 72 right um in 77, there were amendments. In 87, there was amendments as well to address the toxics and stormwater, which is, I think, Amanda's going to talk about. All right. So one of the bigger controversies that you'll hear about today is what is a water. So for example, one of the things that I do is that like, if somebody is discharging a pollutant from a point source into the water of the United States without a permit, they're committing a felony. As, as the, you know, the knowing discharge, so intentional, not a, as a result of a mistake or an error or an accident, but if you're knowingly discharging a pollutant from a point source, and we'll talk about what point sources are, um, into a water of the United States without a permit, you are committing a felony. Now, what are waters of the United States is something that has been the subject of much controversy uh, very recently, uh, starting with several cases, then went to Rapanos, uh, we will talk about what Rapanos, the Rapanos uh, Supreme Court case, talks about. And it's a question about the nexus between the navigability of a water and the water that you're dealing with. So if it's a small creek and there's not, there's not necessarily a significant nexus between that creek and a navigable water, uh, and navigability means that you can put a boat and sort of go around, or a kayak, I guess you can say. Uh, uh, so if there's not that nexus, then you may have a problem of showing that we are talking about waters of the United States. Uh, and then somebody else is talking about this as well, right? Kathy. Okay. Kathy, that's on you. <laughs> um, all right. So water quality standards. Um, so the Clean Water Act uh, is a neat statute because it defines one of the aims is to address the water quality standards of our waters, right? So how do we address the water quality standards is by three criteria. One is the designated use. The second one is the water quality criteria that would uh, address how we qualify the, how clean the water is in order to be used for that designated use. And if the water quality is really high, then we have certain provisions to make sure that it's not degraded. And that's what, those are what are called anti-degradation policies. So again, we measure our quality standards by three things. Designated use, for example, we say, we're gonna be able to swim in this particular uh, creek or lake or river. Uh, we want people to be able to fish in there. And once we designate, and these are the states that are typically designating these uses, then we, the agency with, in conjunction with the states, develop water quality criteria that would be a measure of how clean this particular water is in relationship to the use. So we may establish certain pH values, we may establish toxicity values, we may establish uh, how many dischargers can go into that particular water, water body based on the designated use. Everybody follow me? Um, it's a very straightforward way of doing it. And if you think about it, how else can we measure whether or not we're being effective in protecting a, a water? It's, that's the idea. The idea is you have to have effective objective criteria in order to decide whether or not this particular water body is clean, if you will. And that's how we do it. Um, and this is a 
uh, true not only about the clean water, but other statutes in the environmental world. The states have really the primary responsibility to address and develop these water quality standards. Now, the EPA still um, has the enforcement authority to make sure that the states are actually following with what they say, but it's really the states who are primarily responsible for doing, for doing it. And we provide grants, the EPA provides grants, provides uh, the ability and, you know, sort of oversight to the states. Uh, one of the ones that we're going to be talking about is the Chesapeake Bay is a great example of how we address a particular problem. And we're extremely successful, in my opinion, on uh, restoring the quality of the Chesapeake Bay. So, all right. Um, I think I covered this already. So, this. Um, um, let me go back to the total maximum daily loads. It's uh, one of the ways that we address uh, the Clean Water Act. I, is somebody else also talking about this or? We we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. So basically we identify areas that are problematic in terms of water quality standards, and we decide which one of those waters are impaired and we generate the list. And when I say we, I mean the states and EPA. We generate a list of those areas that are impaired, and we address those with a particular tool we call this TMDL, the total maximum daily loads. And that is just a way to address how many pollutants are we gonna allow to go into this particular water body based on the quality, based on the quality standards, based on the, uh, the designated uses, um, and based on the sort of like the circumstances surrounding this particular water body. Um, and this is actually a picture of the Chesapeake Bay. It's a beautiful, as you know, we EPA has a huge initiative regarding the Chesapeake Bay. I was part of it. It's amazing. Uh, we have had a lot of enforcement in that area, both civil and criminal, uh, and we're really very uh, protective of the Chesapeake Bay. Next one. All right, so how do we calculate this? We'll go back to the I cover that. Um, bear with me one second, I'm apologize. Oh. What was that? Um, I don't have my cleaning glasses, that's why I'm oh did I went far or go back one? Yeah, Okay. So it's a calculation of certain particular criteria. So T and the L, the total maximum daily loads are calculated by you know mathematical formula, which um, is uh, discharges from point sources, discharges from non-point sources and the natural background, there's those we add, and then we have what we call a margin of safety. So this is a very technical scientific way of determining that we, while we can decide what are the, non -po the point sources and non-point sources discharges that are coming to this particular water body, we also need to address a pot potential sort of uncertainty that is addressed in the, you know, the way that discharges go, the way that the water body, the way that the hydrology works, uh, and all ma many other scientific uh, elements that go into determining what is this maximum amount of a particular pollutant that can be added to a water body. And we still are meeting again the water quality standards. Remember that, right? And those are addressed in the 40 CFR. For those of you who are like, want to go to sleep, uh, started reading all this 130.7, and it's this long regulations that are extremely complicated. They're actually not as complicated as the one would think, but they are narrative description of what I just told you. It's not easy if you're not a scientist to go address those. These are some of the complications that we have when we're enforcing these provisions. All right, um, this is one of the other neat things that we have, and this is why the statue is so powerful as well. Uh, one of the first provisions is that it reads, except in compliance with this section and section 1342 and 1344, which are the uh, point source and the permits that are required under the Corps of Engineers for dredge material. If you're dredging, if you're filling out a wetland, uh, you would need to have a permit. If you are discharging uh, from a point source, you would need a permit. But the 
important thing here is that the discharge of any pollutant by any person is unlawful unless you have a permit, right? And that is extremely powerful. That is extremely helpful when you're doing enforcement because nobody can say, oh, I didn't know that I didn't need a permit. You actually need a permit for everything that you do, right? Pretty much. So it's a great provision. Uh, it's there for you to review. Um, th these are gonna go quickly because I think Amanda's gonna cover this, but they are three independent permit or certifications that are required. The first one is section 401, talks about the state water quality certification. These are uh, issues that are addressed at the state level when you are trying to address discharging into a water body, but only on the, at the state level. Um, Section 402 authorizes EPA to issue what we call the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permits, and those are the ones controlling the discharge of wastewater into navigable waters. So these are the typical uh, POTWs, the waste wastewater treatment plants, discharging after they, they collect the sewage, they treat it, and then discharge into a water of the United States. Uh, they need a permit in order to do that, and then we call that an MPDS permit. Uh, section 404, while EPA has jurisdiction as well, as well, it's really a Corps of Engineer issue, and, and that the Corps of Engineer is the one the agency responsible for issuing permits regarding the discharge of dredge material or fill material into wetlands. Uh, there's been a lot of great cases associated with the discharge of fill uh, material into wetlands. Uh, in fact, one of the Rapanos cases, one of those where the individuals, I think, put sand into this area. It was litigated for more than 20 years, finally resolved uh, through the agreement or disagreement of the agency. Um, and I'll leave it at that and uh, somebody else will talk about it. All right. Um, so any applicant, this is the first one. So the, out of the three, if we go back 401, 402, and 404 are the main um, provisions that we're talking about. Uh, so section 401 is a state water quality certification. If you are an applicant for a license or permit, that may result in a discharge into navigable waters, you need to obtain a certificate basically from the state that allows you to do it. So it's sort of like a way of indirectly dealing with projects that may not are causing direct discharges, but as they develop, you can they may have an impact in terms of discharges, but it's not necessarily a wastewater treatment plant, which is obviously going to discharge into water in the United States. It may be a project related to uh, anything that you can, mining perhaps, uh, or other major projects, right? Any experience with that? Or, uh... The 401, yeah. I've, I've got that a little bit about that in my presentation. Um, so this would come up in states that do not have delegated authority where the EPA right. is issuing the NPDS permit. Right. There would have to be a corresponding state 401 water quality certification. That's right. Thank you. Um, so. Um, the NPDS permit problem is for the one I explained. I think all the states, uh, I think this is still true, that all the states that said New Hampshire, Vermont, and D.C. are authorized to implement the NPDS program. So it's really a state agency who is providing the permit to the particular discharger. Uh, and this could go into different categories of discharges from the, again, the wastewater treatment plants. It could be industrial users that are discharging into a sewage. It may re be required to have pre-treatment um, a pretreatment of the waste before it goes into a POTW. All those are addressed through here. Um, and I think, um, and those are. Okay, you want I to say something? something on sure. this one? Yeah, yeah. It makes sense for me to uh, throw it in here rather than bring it up um, later. But so right now it's, um, it's New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New Mexico, and Idaho that okay. don't have delegated authority. Other states don't have full delegation. So they'll have authority to administer the NPDS program, but perhaps not biosolids or pretreatment. Right. Idaho, just on June 5th, their program was approved by EPA. So as of July 1 of this year, they will start issuing uh, municipal uh, NPDS permits. Okay, right. And then they're on a schedule to, uh, to issue other things uh, like on a yearly basis, start to ramp up and what they, what they actually administer. Massachusetts is in the beginning stages of looking at delegation. They have to have legislation, so they've been working on that. Uh, so no application has been filed in Massachusetts okay. today. And you can go into the, so there's important distinctions between what the NPDS program is, the pretreatment program, uh, and other discharging, uh, and we'll address those, I think, later, or we can address any questions. 
Um, so the MPDS program, actually, it's, it's right here, never mind. Um, it's a stormwater program, so it's um, discharges from three different things, municipal separate storm sewer systems, like construction activities and industrial activities, right? Um, and I think somebody else is talking about the Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily loads and the permits, I'll leave it at that. Um, and then again, section 404 program is regarding wetlands and the field wetlands, which we already covered. Um, all right, mining. Um, there is a good connection between the Clean Water Act and what we call one minute. Okay. Um, uh, this uh, uh, Surface Mining uh, Control Act, I think it is. Um, and since I only have one minute, we'll talk about it. Uh, perhaps in the questions, I want to address the enforcement of uh, the Clean Water Act has civil liability, which is basically strict liability, and has strict li or criminal liability for negligent discharges and knowing discharges. And negligent discharges would be a misdemeanor, and knowing discharges, which are intentional, would be a criminal violation. Um, and they're great tools for enforcement. Uh, it's my bread and butter every day. Most of my cases are clean water by cases, I would say the clean majority. Um, and other tools of enforcement, of course, include inspection. Uh, we can send information requests to, uh, for example, wastewater treatment plants that are, may not be uh, complying with their particular permits, are having difficulties with uh, doing certain things. We have certain instances where they have bypasses. And while they can do that in certain circumstances, they may not notify the agency. That's a problem. Uh, so we have a way of doing that. We also have the ability to refer our cases to the state for state enforcement as opposed to federal. Uh, and then we also review those permits very carefully. I already talked about the criminal enforcement. Uh, one neat section is the sitting citizen suit authority. So you, a citizen, can actually sue the agency for things that we're not doing right, uh, and then sort of take the uh, put yourself in our shoes and try to enforce the statute in a way through the citizen suits and we people do it all the time and it's a great tool honestly um, all right uh and the last thing i will talk is about oil and hazardous substances is a special provision on the act if you're discharging oil and this is a result of the ex Valdez, there there's specific provisions of enforcement regarding the discharges of oil uh into waters of the united states and that's a separate provision from the section 40302, uh, which would be the one, the regular one. All right. Uh, and with that, I think I'd leave it with, yeah. Kathy, is that you? That is I. Hi, everyone. This is Kathy Robb. I'm a partner at Sod Pageant and Rizal in New York City, practicing environmental law. And I want to thank ELI for asking me here today and joining on this terrific panel and to all of you for joining us. As David said, uh, the Clean Water Act has been a successful and powerful statute. Today, I'm going to be talking about what navigable waters or waters of the United States, the jurisdictional waters regulated under the Clean Water Act may mean. Uh, and you all will uh, see my slides and hear me, but you are not going to be seeing me. So don't worry that your screen is not working properly. Um, Next slide, please. Water's more on everyone's minds than ever, no doubt in part of, uh, as a result of the water quality issues in drinking water, which have been highly publicized and reported from Flint, Michigan and other cities over the past three or four years, which involved lead. Uh, and Americans, the Gallup does a poll every year about uh, Americans' views about various environmental issues, and Americans are expressing that they're more concerned about water pollution than they've been since 2001. So this is an important area. Next slide, please. The Clean Water Act is 45 years old and counting, and we're still grappling with its jurisdiction and what uh, cooperative federalism means under the Act. Today, I'm going to focus on the definition of navigable waters or waters of the United States, which we also often refer to as WOTUS. Um, 
it's the cornerstone of the Clean Water Act. I'm also going to briefly discuss cooperative federalism and Chevron deference and the status of the 2015 WOTUS rule and subsequent developments that are ongoing about the jurisdictional definitions. Uh, the, David showed you the basic prohibition for the Clean Water Act. EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers administer the Clean Water Act and discharge into navigable waters is prohibited unless it is permitted, as David mentioned. And each of those terms uh, is a term of art that has been defined in the statute, the regs, and also case law. Next slide, please. Under the statute, in the statute itself, um, navigable waters is defined as waters of the United States. And we're going to use the terms interchangeably for our purposes here today. The definition covers all sections of the Clean Water Act. Regulations um, uh, also have been promulgated for uh, most of the sections of the Clean Water Act. There's an outline in your written materials uh, about waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act from the beginning to the 2015 WOTUS rule. If you want to take a deeper dive and look at citations and definitions and deeper descriptions of the rules and regulations as they've evolved over the years than we can do today in our program. Next slide, please. So these are the prohibition elements of a Clean Water Act violation. Uh, you cannot have navigable water discharges except as in compliance with the particular permitting program that applies to your activity. Next slide, please. Uh, all these terms are going to be discussed further by Amanda when she talks about the permitting program next. But for the context of our discussion, it's very easy to see here that the muddy red water coming out of a pipe is going into a waterway. And this is a photo of a discharge from a classic point source into jurisdictional waters and uh, is regulated under the Clean Water Act. Next slide, please. Non-point source. Uh, is runoff that has no discrete confined conveyance and more diffuse flows. And these are uh, photos of that. And excluded are um, the items listed on the slide. This is through the regulations. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the modern Clean Water Act statute uh, began in 1972, and Clean Water Act authority at the federal level is under the, uh, as a result of the Commerce Clause. Most states own and regulate their own water. Uh, the statute reiterated in 1972, and the language is there on your slide, that the federal regulation does not affect states' rights or jurisdiction over waters. This is known as cooperative federalism, which applies to the Clean Water Act as well as some of our other main environmental statutes. Next slide, please. In 1977, the Clean Water Act was amended and cooperative federalism was reiterated. Uh, stating it's called the Wallop Amendment after the senator that put it into the statute, state jurisdiction is not to be impaired and federal and state governments shall cooperate with each other on the Clean Water Act. And this um, colors everything that uh, goes forward under the Clean Water Act. There's a lot of discussion give and take between the federal level and the state level regarding water. Next slide, please. Just so you know, there was also a 1978 EPA legal memoranda that weighed in on cooperative federalism and uh, stated that the uh, statutory language meant that the state's rights are not impaired, expect 
except as expressly stated uh, in the statute. Next slide, please. So what is the struggle about what navigable waters or waters of the United States means for jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act? Water is an area where one picture is often worth a thousand words. And here is a photo of traditional navigable waters. It's surface water, it flows, and we could all agree by looking at the photos that you could float a boat on it. Next slide. And there are the boats, traditional navigable waters. Next slide, please. Over the years, many other areas have also been characterized as waters of the United States subject to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Uh, they include wetlands, which is depicted in this North Carolina photo. Next slide. Old logging areas that have water seasonally. Next slide. Places where water collects seasonally. Next slide and places where water perhaps once collected. Next slide. And filled in collection areas. This is a filled in farm ditch. Next uh, slide. And uh, ditches such as this roadside ditch, which was constructed and maintained in Maryland, the Deaton Ditch. Next slide. So, all of these designations of jurisdiction of waters of the United States have come about as a result of case-by-case -case determinations by the Corps on whether permits are needed for activities in particular areas. The Supreme Court, as David mentioned, has considered what navigable waters means in three key cases. They're called Riverside Bayview, Swank, and Rapanos Carabel. And again, if you need a complete uh, citation and description, go to the outline that's posted online. In Riverside Bayview, which is in 1985, the Supreme Court considered whether wetlands actually abutting a navigable water uh, are jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. And they said, yes, there's a significant nexus between the navigable water and um, the wetlands abutting, and uh, that that is within the regulatory purview of the Clean Water Act. Then in 2001, in a case called Swank, um, there was an isolated pond that the uh, Army Corps was uh, regulating at as a result of migratory birds having stopped there from time to time. And the, this, this was referred to, the regulation that um, was uh, the subject of the case was referred to as the migratory bird rule. And uh, the Supreme Court said uh, migratory birds on an isolated pond don't establish jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act. and uh, there was not a significant nexus between the isolated pond and navigable waters, waters of the United States, and invalidated the rule. Then in 2006, two cases uh, that involved uh, wetlands uh, adjacent to non-navigable tributaries of navigable waters were combined in in the Supreme Court, that's this is called Rapanos Carabel, and uh, the court said that it's jurisdictional these wetlands that are adjacent to non-navigable tributaries where there is a significant nexus, and then that is the dis discussion that we're still under today about what that actually means. Next slide, please. So Rapanos was a 4-1-4 decision by the court with Justice Scalia writing for the plurality of four, saying that WOTUS, Waters of the United States, could include relevant, relatively permanent waters, but not intermittent 
or ephemeral waters, and also wetlands with a continuous connection to permanent waters. Justice Kennedy, in a separate opinion, which uh, was a concurrence, said that adjacent wetlands could be protected if they had a significant nexus hydraulically to non-navigable tr tributaries of nav navigable waters. So when you have a 414 split in the Supreme Court, which we did in this critical case that involves waters of the United States, there's a doctrine called the Marx Doctrine, which applies to these split decisions that came out of a 1977 Supreme Court decision. And what it says is, if no single rationale is supported by five justices in a majority opinion, which we didn't have in Rapanos, the holding of the court is viewed as the position taken by the concurring justices on the narrowest grounds that pulls the plurality and the concurrence together. And that opinion is called the controlling opinion. So for purposes from 2006 of dealing with what uh, waters are jurisdictional, uh, it is Justice Kennedy's opinion that has been considered the controlling opinion by some courts some courts applied both the uh, Justice Scalia and Kennedy are articulations. And um, uh, there was a lot of confusion and throwing up of hands uh, about where we were going with the jurisdictional uh, waters. And this becomes key, this distinction between Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy becomes key uh, when we look at the 2015 WOTUS rule, which we're going to in a minute. Um, and it applies to, it, it's applying Rapanos to challenges to the WOTUS rule and the subsequent articulations of what waters of the United States may mean for us under the Clean Water Act. But the uh, fast forwarding to 2015, the WOTUS rule was based on Justice Kennedy's significant nexus articulation, and it references that almost 500 times. About two weeks ago, the court issued a decision in a criminal case that's unrelated to environmental law, but uh, the parties had briefed uh, as a result of the case whether this Marx doctrine should still apply. A lot of people are critical of it. Um, the Supreme Court did not uh, decide whether Marx is good, bad, or indifferent. They sidestepped the debate and decided the criminal case on narrower grounds. But they did reverse the 11th Circuit, which had relied on Marx in applying its decision. And many, thinks that, many think that the Marx doctrine should be abandoned but doubt that the Supreme Court will do it. Next slide, please. So since Rapanos, many case-by-case -case jurisdictional determinations have been made by the Army Corps, often conflicting depending on which core district you're in. And uh, guidance and draft rules were considered between 2006 and 2015. And uh, those are all described in detail in the outline. We're going to jump to the 2015 WOTUS rule. And that uh, is also described in detail in the posted outline. Next slide, please. So the rule was intended to clarify what waters of the US really means. Uh, and whenever there is an interpretation of a statute required, the concept of Chevron deference is likely to come up. And um, it, it's worth it to take a tiny detour to just talk about what Chevron deference means. It's um, from a case in 1984 called Chevron versus NRDC. And it, it, the court held that when Congress passes a law that doesn't have clear meaning, the court should defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of the law. 
And in one of those interesting coincidences of life, EPA was then headed by Justice Gorsuch's mother, Ann Gorsuch, who supported in that case deference, while Justice Gorsuch himself has been a vocal uh, critic of the Chevron Doctrine. The Chevron Doctrine um, he, uh, was heard in, uh, in late May uh, in oral argument on a petition to the court in another case out of the Ninth Circuit where a, sta a statute had been silent on, not ambiguous, but silent, but given deference. And uh, one of the parties had asked the court to consider the scope of deference as a result, arguing that deference applies when statutes are ambiguous, not when they're silent. And the court also sidestepped the deference issue and decided that case on other narrower grounds, also a criminal case. So um, Chevron deference has been raised in connection with a number of the recent jurisdictional issues under the Clean Water Act, and um, it, it, it's under um, a, a lot of debate as well. Um, next slide, please. Back to the WOTUS rule. Uh, here's the definition of waters of the United States that uh, was put into the WOTUS rule. Next slide, slide, please. Thousands of comments on the draft rule were filed by states, environmental groups, industry groups, trade associations, individuals. And uh, this is just from one state, Kansas's comments. Uh, a lot of states uh, filed maps like this showing the uh, currently designated WOTUS in their state. Next slide, slide, please. And this is a graphic of uh, Kansas's uh, increased regulatory area and jurisdictional area under the Clean Water Act under the rule. Um, this is one of the disputes that has been a large part of, of the challenges <laughs> to the 2015 WOTUS rule. And you can see that um, uh, the streams are um, uh, many, many more miles uh, of regulated area, uh, which, you know, depending on your point of view, um, uh, raises different issues um, for you. So next slide, please. So the 2015 WOTUS rule was published in 2015 and immediately challenged. The Sixth Circuit took jurisdiction after a lot of jumping around. And after litigating for three years about where the rule should be challenged, uh, which is not stated in the Clean Water Act, the Supreme Court said in January that the rules should be challenged in the district court not the circuit court. So challenges uh, are beginning anew in the district court. Next slide, please. In the meantime, the President Trump was elected and a month after taking office, issued an executive order telling EPA and the Corps to rescind or revise the rule and directed them to apply Justice Scalia's decision in Rapanos uh, uh, in considering uh, any new rulemaking interpreting what navigable waters means. Next slide, please. In response, in 2017, EPA and the Corps put in place a recodification of the existing rules, which are all from 2008 and are described in the outline, and intended to bridge the new rule that will eventually come out uh, from EPA. Um, next slide, please. That interim rule, the recodification rule, is also the subject of challenge in multiple lawsuits. Next slide, please. And of course, it was intended to leave the 2008 status quo in place, which is what we're still operating under. Next slide, please. Uh, and just to note um, that it was noted in the recodification rule publication too, but 
uh, even at the time of Rapanos, uh, pretty much everybody, including Chief Justice Roberts, in his concurring opinion in Rapanos, um, uh, had asked that a rulemaking be done to clarify navigable waters and waters of the United States, meaning under the Clean Water Act. Next slide, please. Uh, an additional separate rule was put into place in February of 2018, which is called the suspension rule. It's also being challenged in litigation and adds an applicability date of 2020 to the 2015 WOTUS rule intended to give the administration sufficient time to promulgate a new rule. And I guess what our takeaway can be from all of this is that it's a safe prediction that we're going to continue to operate under the 2008 regs for a while yet. I'm going to turn it over now to Amanda, who is going to talk in more detail about permitting. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I am so pleased to be with you today, and uh, I hope that you're taking full advantage of the ELI Summer Series. It's amazing, and just like your neighbor's newspaper, it's actually free. So, um, so I, I send, we send, NACWA sends um, our interns here. We've got one here today, Daniel's over here. So I work for the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, and we are an advocacy organization that represents the interest of publicly owned wastewater and stormwater utilities across the country. So we are point sources. And today I will be focusing on the permitting aspects of the Clean Water Act. Now some of this David covered as well as, as Karen. Uh, so I'll skim some of it. The general prohibition we've already discussed in section 301. The, um, the permit program, the 402, that's the National Pollutant uh, Discharge Elimination System uh, permitting program is 402. You have other sections that deal with the effluent limitation guidelines. We have a uh, process for cooperate, cooperation between the federal and state governments, and that's 401, right. and there is 402 uh, part of that as well. And then we have the dredge and fill permitting system, which is 404, and that has been discussed. So here again is the, um, is the very, um, very broad prohibition. When you look at the, the language of the Clean Water Act in section 301, discharge of a pollutant, um, and it involves any addition of any pollutant to a navigable water or waters of the US from any point source. So David discussed addition, very, very broad, um, um, or pollutant rather is very broad. Um, from a, a point source though, is something that we'll discuss today because um, in particular with regard to groundwater, there's been a lot of recent litigation. Uh, MPDS program regulates these discharges through technology-based effluent limits and water quality-based effluent limits. And there are also TMDLs that are involved in how, how you set limits. We, looked at this or talked about this, David did. Um, this is just a map uh, that needs to be updated now. As I said, Idaho has received approval um, and Massachusetts may in another year that may change. Now, regardless of who is administering the program, there's uh, certain requirements. Permits have to go out for public notice and comment. There has to be an opportunity for public participation. And when states get delegated programs, their programs have to be as stringent as what EPA would do. Uh, and if a state isn't as stringent then, or is doing something improperly, EPA in theory can uh, withdraw that, uh, that delegation. <laughs> Point sources. Here are some examples of a point source, which is any discernible, confined, discrete conveyance. We've got combined sewer overflows, so that's something that we'll talk about a little bit more, but um, our members deal with that. DC Water here locally mm -hmm. has combined sewer yep. overflows. You've got municipal publicly owned treatment works. Um, you've got the stormwater system, the municipal separate storm sewer system, or MS4. Then you have uh, confined animal feeding operations whereas agriculture is exempt. If it's confined and meets certain um, definitions, then it is considered a point source. You've got the incidental vessel discharges, non-municipal industrial waste, and then uh, construction stormwater. 
Um, so a little quiz here, and those who are participating by webinar, feel free to, to participate on uh, where you are. For point sources here are four pictures. This right here, let's assume that this is a construction uh, zone of more than an acre. Would, would this be considered a point source regulated by the NPDES pro, uh, program? What do we think? Yes. And even if it, if it were less than an acre, if we are to assume that this um, is a, a municipal separate storm sewer system, then that would be a point source under the Clean Water Act. Here we've got uh, return flow, irrigated, agricultural land. No, exempt. This one is, um, this is a logging road. Assume this is U.S. forest land. So logging road, storm water, it's channelized. That there's been, it's actually no, it's exempt as not part of, it's considered storm water and it's not part of the industrial um, uh, coverage under storm water. So there was litigation that went up to the Supreme Court on this in EPA rulemaking. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. And then there, confined animal eat, feeding operation we already covered. Okay, so if you wanna look at the landscape, if it's easier to understand, here you've got wastewater treatment, you've got a city, uh, you've got defined pipes, and then you've got urban runoff, um, the stormwater discharges through streets and pipes, et cetera. So, so for those, it's very easy when you're dealing with wastewater treatment because you do have a pipe that extends um, and discharges into a surface water. Stormwater discharges is a little more attenuated, um, but, but it is covered. Forestry is like the example, if it's U.S. forest land, then um, that it would come up in that sense, not covered. And agricultural runoff, again, only if it meets the definition of a confined animal feeding operation. So when you're looking at discharges, um, with stormwater, you really do have to determine, is it in one of those few areas that are covered? Because the rest of it is con considered non-point source, diffuse, um, and is, um, is then left to the states under the cooperative federalism framework that Kathy touched on in her presentation. Um, from the inception of the Clean Water Act, they knew that non-point source was very difficult to control. And uh, so they set it up that the Federal Clean Water Act would cover point sources, but for non-point sources, that would be the state's responsibility. Indirect discharges, this would be the pretreatment program. That's where you have uh, industrial users, they discharge process water into the wastewater uh, system that goes to a uh, POTW to be treated, and they have to meet certain limits. Um, and until recently, indirect discharge, when I, ever, when I heard this in the Clean Water Act context, I always thought about pretreatment. Mm -hmm. But there is right. a case that just came down in the Ninth Circuit um, that uh, discusses and created a new theory of liability called the indirect discharge theory, which I will talk about in a few slides. Non-point source, I already mentioned that is uh, the state's responsibility, primarily. Now, we talked about TMDLs. Um, and we talked about the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. There was a recent case, the American Farm Bureau challenged the Chesapeake Bay waste load allocations the, because there were allocations for non-point source. So they looked at, it's a pollution diet. They looked at the Chesapeake Bay, they look at what it's impaired for, then they look at all the sources that go in. And uh, then they work with the states to attribute the waste load allocations to those sources. Non-point sources, it's permissible to, uh, to have them brought into the fold in this manner. American Farm Bureau challenged that. Uh, it went, uh, went to the Third Circuit, I believe, and then to the Supreme Court. Right. And the Supreme Court uh, did not review it, so the Third Circuit decision stood, and it upheld that watershed type of approach that includes um, non-point sources. If you want to. Yeah, no, for those of you, it's a great read. It actually explains really well how the Clean Water Act works. All the, it's amazing. It's a long opinion, but it's worth reading if you're interested. I have the site uh, and I can give it at the end. Is it Third Circuit? Is that right? I think it's Third okay. Circuit, but I can do that. <laughs> he will correct me if I I'm will, wrong. I'll, I'll it is the first. Third Circuit. <laughs> this is Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Oh, Elizabeth may be covering this too. Uh, so let's talk about groundwater for a minute because I think this issue is absolutely fascinating from an academic standpoint. It's kind of like a, a mini WOTUS. Uh, 
so the question here is not, it's not about jurisdictional waters. Um, it's not whether groundwater is jurisdictional. Courts and um, the Clean Water is pretty clear that it's not a water of the U.S. But the, the question really is, is we have a release from point source that reaches um, a groundwater and thereafter flows to a jurisdictional water, surface water, wetland, whatever is jurisdictional. Does that, is that prohibited by section 301 of the Clean Water Act? Does it trigger the requirement to get an NPDES permit as a point source? Um, and, and it's difficult because where do you draw the line between non-point source and point source? So if everything that gets into groundwater and groundwater migrates to surface waters. If all that's covered, then it, it creates a lot of uh, regulatory uncertainty about what needs to be done, what needs to be permitted. And this is coming up um, in litigation across the country. It's, it's been litigated for a long time, but um, in the last two and a half, three years, we've seen an explosion of, of case law. And environmental groups are using this cause of action in, in cases. Um, it started with coal ash, uh, so like uh, with uh, coal-fired power plants, they have, um, they have waste from uh, burning coal that they put into ponds. Often these ponds, because they have to be located near surface water for their cooling, mm -hmm. these ponds are located in very close proximity to surface water. Most of them are unlined, and so you can see how there would be toxics that would get into groundwater, and the surface water is right there. Um, so our our membership though is getting pulled into this uh, because you can't just if you're going this route through the Clean Water Act and the NPDES per program you can't just hollow out the coal ash it would have to be applicable the broader definition would have to be applicable to all sorts of these discharges so I do want to go through a, just a couple of the cases I'm going to start with the Ninth Circuit Maui case, and, and full disclosure, Maui is a member of NACWA. And um, in that case, they have a Safe Drinking Water Act permitted uh, UIC, underground injection well. So they, they treat their wastewater uh, from Maui to uh, tertiary levels. And then um, through years of working with the state and EPA, they did not want to have an ocean outfall. So it was decided inject that, get the safe drinking water permit, um, and you're covered. So they're in full compliance with their safe, safe drinking water act permit. But what happened is, is that over an average of 10 months, the, the well water got into groundwater and then seeped along about a two mile area of the coast. And um, an action was brought by an environmental group saying that this requires an NPDES permit. So this went up to the Ninth Circuit and there's a recent decision in February where the Ninth Circuit held um, that, um, yes, uh, NPDES permit is required. Ironically, EPA had, under the Obama administration, they had filed an amicus brief um, proposing there, saying that this is a clear, direct hydrologic connection. Uh, so where that happens, you have, you have a discharge from a point source, it's clearly connected to surface water, therefore, that is the equivalent of discharging to a surface water. The Ninth Circuit shot that down. They said that language appears nowhere. Direct hydrologic connection appears nowhere in the Clean Water Act. Uh, but then what the Ninth Circuit did is go on to create their own test, which is this indirect discharge theory. And what they said is you've got to have a point source. You've got to have um, a, a, a fairly traceable discharge. So it's got to be the functional uh, functional equivalent of a point source. So it's fairly traceable and more than a de minimis amount. So that was the standard that the Ninth Circuit um, created. Then you have the Fourth Circuit. And this is a different case. This was a petroleum spill. Uh, so you have a pipeline. The pipeline broke. You had a nasty oil spill, environmental damage that seeped into groundwater, got into a surface water. Um, here, it was a split decision, unlike the Ninth Circuit, which was unanimous, but they did find that, um, that there was a Clean Water Act liability requiring a permit. Um, they they used EPA's direct hydrologic connection theory to base that on, but they then reconciled, they said, well, it's pretty much the same as what the Ninth Circuit found. So now you've got two circuit court cases, 
And you have a 1994 Seventh Circuit case that many argue creates a split in the circuit. So all this is gonna go up to the Supreme Court late summer. They'll petition the Supreme Court for review. Whether the court takes it depends on a lot of factors. Um, a circuit split is definitely one that, that would prompt them to accept it. Um, EPA's action on this, whether they think it's, we just discussed Chevron deference, whether they think the statute is clear, and they could step in and be the appropriate body to say the statute's clear, either it's in or it's out, or do they think it's ambiguous and should be left to EPA? So through this, you have EPA uh, putting out a request for comments. This is not a request for rulemaking. It's sort of they're trying to, to show that they're doing something on this issue. So in February, they put this out. The comment period has closed. Um, what they do with those comments, we don't know. Are they going to come back with a rulemaking? So there's a lot to watch here, and in, including congressional interest. Um, we have Congress, the Senate Environmental and Public Works Committee held a hearing. There was something in the uh, 2018 omnibus bill about um, having EPA come and report back on this issue. With Republicans in control, they very want, much want there not to be a permit requirement. Um, but there's, um, there's a great paper that is posted on the ELA website for this series, and Kathy wrote it. And it gives, if you want to know more about this, it gives uh, a lot more information, including the cases. Uh, Kathy also submitted, I, uh, I testified before the Senate on behalf of NACWA, but I, I advocate a position. So I'd rather you read Kathy's, and, and then you can decide on your own what you think. And yes. I don't know about what EPA is doing, by the way. <laughs> yeah, funny enough, EPA, and there's some litigation in New England right now on septic tanks, and septic yeah. tanks, same thing. You would think right. that they would they would say direct hydrologic connection theory if it's right. there it exists well they took um a 180 view saying no this is never a right. point source so they're gonna have to reconcile that and just one more interesting note on that in one of the cases in the sixth circuit it's the tennessee valley authority so when it if and when and they intend to um to appeal this to petition the supreme court for review if it gets to the supreme court it's the Department of Justice that will have to represent right. TVA in the Supreme Court, right. and yet Department of Justice on, is on record in the Ninth Circuit as supporting a direct hydrologic right. connection theory. So it will be the Solicitor General's office, along with actually the Environment and Natural Resources Division, has an appellate section that will be leading the effort in these cases. It's an interesting sort of yeah. entanglement. Yeah, uh, <laughs> one important thing that we, uh, I, I think I was supposed to say at the beginning, but remember that, that the Clean Water Act protects surface water. We're not dealing with the groundwaters. That's what all yeah. these complexities come to be. But the reality is we're protecting, under the Clean Water Act, we're protecting surface water, the rivers, the lakes, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks right. for that clarification. Yeah. With MPDS permitting, you can have individual or general permits. Individual is what it sounds like. You have um, particular requirements that are tailored to that given discharge. Then with general permits, you have an activity that's similar, where um, you could have a general set of requirements uh, that would cover anybody who then files a notice of intent to be covered under there. If they meet qualifications, the eligibility, then they can get a general permit. Mm -hmm. Permits do not exceed five years. They have to be uh, renewed and reissued on a five-year basis. However, there are many, many that are administratively um, continued because resource, it's a resource issue for states um, to, to keep up with this permitting cycle. So what happens then? You just abide by the existing permit until you get your new one. Um, we already talked about water quality certification. So let's get into technology-based um, effluent limits. We've got water quality based and TMDL. Technology based are, if you think about, you've got uh, the discharger and then you've got whatever's being discharged in the water body. Technology based is not focused on the water body. It's focused on, it was like the, the first step of the Clean Water Act. Let's see what's possible through technology. Um, and then looking at these categories of industry, such as uh, publicly owned treatment works, you set up um, technology requirements for what can be achieved. Um, and then those, they, they look at technology, they don't look at what's happening or inside the plant. They don't, well, they actually say, do this, meet these levels, and you can't, they can't control sort of how you meet those as long as end of pipe, you're meeting those, those levels. Um, for, for water quality based, they are, this is where you do. So it's a backstop. You look at the water body. 
and you look at whatever the technology, the T-bells, technology-based effluent limits are achieving. And if through those limits, you're not able to comply with water quality standards, the criteria, then there's a process. This is, and you mentioned this, it's a much more analytical scientific process where you have to look at those standards and figure out what the limits will be in order to maintain the designated use of the receiving water body. For water quality criteria, you've got both numeric and narrative. When it's narrative, it could be no toxics and toxic amount. So there's, there's a process for translating those into numeric. Um, it's more complicated, yeah. um, especially when dealing with something like nutrients. Um, it's, it's very complicated. Anti-degradation um, policy applies to water quality based. You touched on this mm -hmm. for uh, technology based. It's anti-backsliding. So that means if you're issuing a new permit, uh, you shouldn't have less stringent requirements and limits than the previous permit. There, there are some exceptions for the most part. That's what you need to know. Uh, TMDLs, I think that we have covered this pretty well, and I'm running out of time. State, state responsibility to list their impaired streams and then develop uh, TMDLs and implement these in permits. So that's going to also be part of how you come up with your, your limits. Monitoring and reporting, this is an honor system. So uh, dischargers will complete discharge monitoring reports. Um, many of them are doing this electronically finally, they're right. getting into the okay. 21st century. Uh, so the federal and the federal uh, regulations will set what those reporting requirements are, and then they will uh, collect representative samples uh, based on what the pollutant is. It could be a 30 day geometric mean, it could be um, averages, that sort of thing, and they report it. And then the permitting agency, whether it's the state or EPA, uh, reviews that. And if there are violations, they can go and, and bring enforcement against um, the discharger. Moving on to wet weather permitting. So you have the Clean Water Act in its beginning, and it's really focused on continuous discharges where um, it's going all the time. Uh, but then in 87, you know, uh, they they amend things to, uh, to address stormwater because they're seeing that we're getting the point sources under control, uh, stormwater is an issue, and so they start looking at ways to address stormwater um, in addition to combined sewer system overflows. A combined sewer system, we have it here in DC, you find it in a lot of older cities. Um, it was considered very efficient at the time. It's where you have your stormwater, and your uh, wastewater. So you have your like your household waste coming out of a building here when you flush the toilet or you know put something down the sink. And then when it rains, you have your stormwater basins that capture water. What happens is that you get a lot of water mixed with sewage in your pipes when you have heavy rainfall. And um, that inundates the system. Your treatment plants are, are very sensitive. They're, they can only handle so much flow coming in. If you take, take in too much flow, you wash out your, your treatment, your, your good bacteria or um, biological treatment, and it can cause a lot of damage. And so what cities have done is they've constructed overflows. And when it gets to a certain level where the plant is going to receive too much flow, that gets diverted and it overflows into uh, surface waters. It's a problem. Uh, there was a, a combined sewer overflow policy that was, um, was enacted in 94, I think. It's now um, actually ratified in the Clean Water Act, so it's part of the Clean Water Act. Um, and so with those combined sewer overflow uh, policies, you have consent decrees existing. And here's a map of where you see uh, the bigger these are the bigger over 50,000 uh, population CSO communities. Mm -hmm. What you have are consent decrees. So the policy envisions a good way to address these are consent decrees because you can't just go out and in uh, a year separate all the systems. And even separation is not now the, um, the preferred method because then your stormwater is not getting any treatment. So a lot of things are being done in DC. There's building huge tunnels. Um, and they're doing this all via consent decree that's not a five year, but it's more, you know, 20 years, we're now seeing 25 years to give time to, to implement these big capital projects. Because the reality is for uh, public utilities, it's you that pay. So how much can the population bear in rate increases in order to fund these things? EPA has done a good job with their enforcement. 
you'll see here of the um, 213 systems that are for populations of 50,000 people or more, um, that there are 208 that are under enforcement, consent decree or negotiation. Okay, so I am running out of time. Let me run through these. This is the uh, 87 amendments. This is where you have the uh, phase uh, large MS4s and industry come into the fold. Uh, you can look these up in my slides. Um, small construction came in. This was, so 1990 is when you had the phase one required to get permits, the rulemaking, and it was uh, 99 when you had the rulemaking for phase two. Mm -hmm. The, it's, it's important to note out for stormwater, it's a, different, it's a different standard. It's maximum extent practical. Normally cost does not come into play at all in the Clean right. Water Act, but with this, with this standard it does. It does um, so you're, you have to do best management practices to the maximum extent uh, practical uh, to achieve what you're going for. Like you can, your goal may be water quality, but if you get to a point where you cannot spend any more as a community, then that's your, your MEP, your maximum extent practical. So cost does come into play. Uh, just these are exemptions from this, uh, the stormwater permitting. Uh, the silviculture is the forest example, and that's the Decker case, and I can provide more information on that. Uh, the 404 dredge and fill program, I think we've covered that uh, pretty well. There are two states that administer it, Michigan and New Jersey. Um, and even though the Corps is the main party for going out and doing uh, jurisdictional determinations, uh, EPA does have the ability to overrule that. And 401 we've covered. So that is all for me. Thank you, Linda. Okay, uh, this is Elizabeth, and I'm beaming in through the wonders of technology. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and am totally impressed by my comrades who were able to cover that much ground in 20 minutes apiece. That's amazing. Um, so uh, I'm bringing up the rear flank here, talking about building on that framework that they've established, talking about some of the policy challenges <laughs> that uh, we have with uh, enforcing these requirements under the Clean Water Act. Let's see, do I have uh, the power? That I do. I have the control. Okay. Um, now, I can't see anybody uh, who might be waving at me to say I'm running out of time, so someone's going to have to speak up and yell at me in the middle if I'm um, going over my time, please. Um, so, uh, just a few policy challenges that I'm going to cover. Um, regulation of water quantity versus water quality, which I believe Kathy touched on a little bit, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL that David mentioned and also Amanda, and then uh, I was asked to talk about water demand and sea level rise or climate change. Which, uh, First of all, uh, the Clean Water Act, back when it was adopted, 1972, largely, and again, this is the 30,000 foot view level that we're doing in this class. Um, so, in general, left water quantity regulation to the states. And this is a provision I think Kathy might have flashed up on the screen already, except as expressly provided in this act. Nothing shall be construed as impairing or in any manner affecting any right or jurisdiction of the states with respect to the waters of such state. Um, and again, the Wallop Amendment that she mentioned in 1977. Policy of Congress, the authority of each state to allocate quantities of water within its jurisdiction shall not be superseded, abrogated, or otherwise impaired by this chapter. Um, and then there was an EPA memo that came out after that. Interestingly enough, I think I saw Kathy added that to your presentation as well, saying that requirements that affect water usage should be imposed only where they are clearly necessary to meet the Act's requirements. So that's the general construct. And as David mentioned, the uh, Clean Water Act in general is dealing with surface water, not groundwater. It's in general dealing with water quality versus quantity. Um, states do regulate water quantity through a variety of different, through their common law and through their state permitting programs, a variety of doctrines, whether it's riparian rights or prior appropriation, depending on where you are in the United States and what the doctrine is. So there's not the national consistency that is set by the water quality rules. Um, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL is actually an ex excellent example of how um, regulation of the Clean Water Act has to be a creative process, a flexible process, and an iterative process at times. Uh, because the Chesapeake Bay TMDL involves numerous states, and um, you have to bring everyone to the table and get them to agree on the requirements that are, are going to be imposed to achieve water quality standards for the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Many tributaries involved, many different governmental layers involved. So. Um, to give you a, a brief history of how it came about, the states 
essentially lacked the resources and sometimes the political will to develop TMDLs back early on. So um, there were a series of was a series of court cases brought, the American Canoe Association cases, um, because there was a feeling there had been a lack of sufficient progress on restoration. Um, and it led to these numerous lawsuits against the EPA for failure to develop TMDLs. And the cases were settled pursuant to consent decrees with the EPA um, and generally required the EPA to develop TMDLs for the base segments by 2011 if the state had not done so by then. Um, there was in Virginia's case, for example, the consent decree set out a TMDL development schedule that went through 2010 um, for the state to meet. The um, states also tried to engage in a series of voluntary agreements, Chesapeake Bay agreements, to try to clean up the water body. Everybody around in the Bay states knew that the Chesapeake Bay needed to be protected and cleaned up, but how to get there, and especially with a voluntary agreement, was subject to discussion. Um, and the result was the Bay was not removed from the impaired waters list through those voluntary agreements alone. Just to give you an indication, there was a 1983 Bay Agreement that first set up the state-federal partnership. Um, to lead to Bay Restoration, 1987 Bay Agreement, where the governors of Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, the EPA Administrator, DC Mayor, uh, made some agreements and commitments. 1992, there were amendments to the Bay Agreement. Chesapeake 2000, as it was called, um, it called for states to act to remove the Bay and its tributaries from the impaired waters list by 2010. There was a, a big call at the time to achieve that, uh, and the headwater states were included on the Chesapeake Executive Council. And also in 2000, um, Congress did amend the Clean Water Act, Section 117, to achieve the goals established in the Chesapeake Bay Agreement and uh, clarifying EPA's role in the process. By, 20, by 2007, uh, the Chesapeake Bay programs, what they call their principal staff committee, requested that EPA develop the TMDL. It was clear that things weren't working as well as they should. And by 2010, um, it was clear the goals would not be met. So by 2008, Chesapeake Bay program recognized the 2010 goal would not be met and the TMDL process began. So it's different um, from the framework for point source permitting that um, Amanda just went through so well, because um, it does have so many different governmental entities involved and it does have um, a, different, a, a different standard that people talk about in a way, you know, under the point source permitting, that was just covered. It's about getting your permit and you're issuing pollutants to a certain extent as allowed by your permit. Um, here, there's a lot of discussion under the Chesapeake Bay TMDL that there is to be no net increase in pollutants. So it's a slightly different approach, trying to uh, improve the water quality. Um, three pollutants are at issue, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. Uh, the states are required to have in place 60% of the required measures by 2017 and 100% by 2025. It's important to note that doesn't mean that all of the reductions that are required by the Chesapeake Bay TMDL have to be achieved by 2025, but the measures have to be in place to achieve that. Um, the Going back to the cooperative federalism approach that was just talked about by a number of the panelists, um, the EPA issued the TMDL but left it to the states to develop their own watershed implementation plans. And so we've had two iterations of that. We're now working on the phase three WIP this year. Um, and again, here we go with the Clean Water Act and the cooperative federalism, that it's a policy of Congress to recognize, preserve, and protect the primary responsibilities and rights of states to prevent, reduce, and eliminate pollution, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Um, so how do you achieve this when you have multiple states involved? How do you enforce that? Um, what the EPA did was they issued something that we call the backstops memo saying to the states, we have to have reasonable assurance that your measures you're putting in place, that you're developing it through your watershed implementation plan, will actually achieve water quality standards and will protect the water quality of the bay. And so to achieve that, we're going to have you submit the watershed implementation plans to us for approval. And if you don't do a good job on those, if you don't put enough protections in place and, and propose enough measures to be taken to improve the water quality sufficiently to comply with the TMDL, then um, we have some backstop measures that we can implement. Um, and this is um, some of the authority that is cited for that, that the administrator of the EPA shall ensure that management plans are developed and implemented. Uh, implementation is begun by signatories to the Bay Agreement. Um, 
And it's imp one of the things that they mentioned in the memo uh, is that they could increase enforcement uh, for existing permittees. They could increase requirements for point source permittees. Um, they could uh, reduce grant funding from the EPA to the states, which is very important funding for the programs that the states have. And another is that they might exercise what's called residual designation authority. And this is an interesting provision. I think, David, I don't recall you covering this in your presentation, but it is, it's a part of the Clean Water Act, the enforcement that they can do is that they can, um, if they determine that a discharge or category discharges within a certain geographic area uh, contributes to a violation of a water quality standard or is a significant contributor of pollutants to waters in the United States, then they can require a permit and then enforce under that. So that is a way to get to pre-existing development and try to get control over their, their discharges of pollutants. Um, so some of the issues uh, with the Bay TMDL, some of the big policy issues, again, you have to be creative and you have to be flexible in this iterative program um, in order to have it change for the different challenges that come down the, as you're implementing this huge TMDL process. The TMDL was challenged, uh, Amanda talked about that a bit, and David, um, and upheld by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. I did send into ELI, I think they're going to make available both the District Court and the Court of Appeals decisions. As David said, it's interesting reading for those of you who are seeking summer beach time reading. Um, it's, it's, a good, uh, <laughs> it's a good opinion setting forth um, a lot of the background material that might be helpful to you. And then um, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Um, there were a number of, of different um, concerns with the people that brought the case. It was brought by the American Farm Bureau and the American Home Builders Association et al. And they were concerned about what they saw as EPA overreach into the realm of what the state should be doing. But also there was concern about precedent because this is, again, an interstate effort. And if it um, is upheld by the courts for the Chesapeake Bay, it could be used for the Mississippi River and other water bodies. So um, the trial judge did say that the Bay TMDL is within the, within the EPA's Clean Water Act authority, and it's, it was not arbitrary or capricious and was subjected to appropriate public notice. And um, the appellate court um, agreed, the three judge panel agreed. So um, there are two year milestones in place under the Bay TMDL to help the states, um, because it is a long time out to 2025, to make sure the states are staying on track. And um, it's in, we, we did a midpoint review where the EPA came in and assessed how each state was doing. One thing that's interesting to note is uh, going back to flexibility and creativity, uh, headwater states such as New York and Pennsylvania have no waterfront benefits on the bay. They have the Susquehanna River coming down, but they don't have the tourism and the real estate values and the aquaculture generated by being on the Chesapeake Bay itself. And so you're asking them to spend dollars and clean up the water quality for people downstream. And um, that's just a reality of the process. Again, the joy of having uh, a multi-state uh, process in place um, is trying to keep everyone at the table and discussing how to achieve this when it's getting, it's going to get more and more costly as we go along. The Conowingo Dam, um, actually for years, uh, people didn't realize it was serving as essentially a large sediment trap for the Chesapeake Bay. And um, it's now uh, no longer doing that. And so we're trying to figure out among the Bay States how to um, deal with that increased um, pollutant load, sediment and nitrogen and phosphorus from that. So again, that requires flexibility. Um, and the Bay program is a multi-state effort with work groups uh, assigned to different topics with state representatives from all the different Bay states and coming to agreement on how best to approach these challenges. Urban stormwater is a big one. Back in 1972, uh, it wasn't as big an issue as it is today. Um, we have more and more impervious cover. When we talk about impervious cover in stormwater world, what we mean by that is rooftops and decks and um, parking lots that are um, impervious so the water doesn't filter through, it sheds off and it creates uh, runoff with greater volume. And so what do we do about that? Because um, as Amanda mentioned, we have construction and um, construction general permits that deal with the larger construction sites and redevelopment sites. But what about the pre prior existing development that um, you can't go back, you don't have the authority to force retrofit. Uh, 
Um, there was an example of um, a TMDL case on the uh, a tributary of Akatink Creek and um, up in Northern Virginia, it was a case, uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation and Fairfax County and Urbanized County in Northern Virginia um, challenged a TMDL that had been issued by the EPA. Uh, it was an attempt to regulate the flow of water itself because the water volume is what was damaging the stream and generating the sediment in stream as it churned up the bottom of the stream. Um, and the court uh, overturned that and sent it back to, um, remanded it back. to, And they're actually having an effort underway in Northern Virginia to think about how to address the pollutants in the Akatate now because it's a real dilemma. What do you do when the water volume itself is causing damage? That residual designation authority that I talked about a minute ago is one way to get to that possibly by some of the larger sites that are generating a lot of runoff. Um, that's something that in the future could be attempted or there's also stream bed restoration projects that are important to create the ability for streams to absorb more of a volume of water, but of course those are quite expensive as well. And then agriculture is another challenge. Um, I think Amanda mentioned that CAFOs of course are permitted, but on the whole, dealing with agriculture is something that has been left to the states through their WIPs, their watershed implementation plans. Um, and that, of course, is dependent upon, frankly, a lot of times political will and what the um, states are willing to do to do that. Um, adjusting the modeling for the Bay TMDL based on projected growth and uh, therefore increased pollutant discharge and on climate change um, is another challenge. Uh, states have agreed, the Bay states agreed that they're going to try to do narrative strategies at this point and committing to adopt climate change targets uh, later on. No actual numbers until after 2021 and the Bay model will be updated and then states will update their, their WIPs, their watershed implementation plans. Um, and this is a picture that I took down in Louisiana actually, it's sad, but um, that's how it's advertised now. If a home has not been flooded, um, the increased need uh, for water and sea level rise and its impacts also pose some policy challenges. Um, just to show you off the EPA's website itself, the U.S. population has doubled, our thirst for water has tripled, at least 40 states are anticipating water shortages by 2024, so obviously water demand is important, and uh, the UN came out with a report estimating the global demand for fresh water will exceed supply by 40 percent in 2030. Um, and sea level rise and saltwater intrusion into our water supplies only exacerbates that problem. So we can create more surface water withdrawals and uh, engage in desalination efforts, which can be expensive, um, build more reservoirs or do groundwater injection projects, which actually calls for a UIC permit under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, it's a separate kind of permitting system than the Clean Water Act, but uh, we have an important project in Virginia that's been proposed, the SWIFT project, sustainable water initiative for tomorrow that would take treated wastewater and inject it into the groundwater aquifer. Not only would that um, push back the water, push the water pressure so that it holds back the saltwater intrusion, but it also would um, inject some pollutants into the groundwater aquifer that would have gone into the Chesapeake Bay otherwise. And so now people are talking about that as a way to achieve Bay TMDL requirements as well. Lots of nuances with um, the Bay TMDL and water quality regulation. So um, surface water withdrawals, um, you know, if you do it too much from a particular stream, it can trigger in-stream flow concerns and water quality standard concerns and reservoirs can trigger wetlands impacting, which, which uh, wetlands permitting, I mean, which Amanda just covered. And also interbasin transfers, is, I won't go into that with this time frame, but it's something that also be, can trigger concerns when you're dealing between water bodies. So when it comes to sea level rise and flooding, we talk in terms of relative sea level rise in areas like Virginia and Louisiana, where there is significant land subsidence. And so it exacerbates the impacts of that. Um, and NOAA tracks uh, and predict has predictive data that it's come out with just in January of last year, talking about various sea level rise scenarios. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists has come out with a report. Um, in fact, they just came out with one I think it was last week, talking about properties that will be underwater because of sea level rise. So it is a serious issue. For example, in coastal Virginia, this, this cone of blue is to show you um, the prediction out of the band of possible sea level rise scenarios based on uh, actual observed data from 1970 through 2016 at Sewell's Point in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, they took those observed values and projected out 40 years into the future. 
and adjusted it to include land subsidence. And as you can see, it can be a serious issue. Um, and that's going to pose all kinds of water quality concerns that people may or may not think about um, that can be regulated under the Clean Water Act if need be. But it's going to take, again, flexibility and creativity. Um, hazardous chemicals, uh, underground storage tanks, metal underground storage tanks, and submerged pipes, and rusting metal concrete reinforcements, the metal reinforcements with it, that are in within the concrete of bridges and uh, highways, all of those don't do well when exposed to saltwater flooding. Um, saltwater inundation of our agricultural fields and water supplies, our stormwater best management practices when they're in high water table areas, as that water table increases and the flooding increases, you can overwhelm your stormwater BMPs and you can have inundated septic systems and um, you can have shellfish areas for shellfish that are condemned because of the E. coli. So there are a number of water quality concerns keyed into water quantity impacts of sea level rise and flooding. Um, so uh, here's to give you a very specific example about climate change. Um, we have to constantly revisit the Bay model um, to figure out if it's uh, appropriately and sufficiently reflecting the changing conditions because it's not static um, in, in the Bay and the water quality and the um, inputs to it. So um, it's difficult to predict with precision. And an example of, of that is in 2017, um, there was a change that the program agreed to in the estimated sea level rise for the Bay um, because they realized they'd been looking at regional adjustments to global tide gauge data and they realized it would be more uh, specific and accurate to look at trends from that Sewell's Point uh, tide gauge in Norfolk that I just mentioned with that graph. And so we had to adjust and, and the amount of sea level rise anticipated. And the result is less dilution, more nutrient reductions required from the base states. So it can have serious impacts on the requirements that are being imposed and the dollars spent to achieve the Bay TMDL requirements. And that's it for me. Can you hear me, Elizabeth? Can you hear me or no? Yes, you should be able to. Elizabeth. She muted her mic. Okay. Wait, yes, I can hear you now. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I was I was curious about the idea of putting uh, the treated water into a groundwater facility, right? Uh, groundwater, of course, is where we get our uh, potable water. Uh, so our drinking water comes from ground resources. Is that something that was addressed or how the impact of that or? And the SWIFT project. That she the SWIFT project. Yes, right? they're treating it. Um, they are treating, actually, they have um, a network of 11 different wastewater treatment plants. It's the Hampton Road Sanitation District Authority. and. Okay. They are taking that water and treating it to a higher level, to a drinking water level, so it's potable water, and before they inject it. But there, there is a monitoring lab proposed, et cetera. Okay, great. Great idea, actually. Um, all right, so questions from okay. the audience? Great. Uh, um, thank you so much to our speakers again for coming in both on the web and in person today. Um, now we're going to open up the floor for Q&A, so if there are any questions from the live audience, we'll take those first. Yeah, great. Uh, so I have two interrelated questions. Um, the first is, uh, what percentage of permits applied for under the Clean Water Act are actually issued? And the second is um, whether acquiring a permit is a particularly onerous process, or if it's more about just sort of checking the boxes. OK, good question. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I understood it correctly, and I don't know, I don't know that I can answer. So how many, so of however many people apply for a permit, how many people actually get it? Which is a great question. Which means that if everybody gets a permit, of course the permit is meaningless. Uh, and how onerous it is to obtain a permit, I think varies. On, so I can answer probably the second question, which is, it depends on what kind of permit you're trying to get. Uh, it depends on how well the facility is running, for example, for a, and Amanda could probably speak to that better. Uh, the, the, what I can answer is that we do look at the permit as our way of enforcing uh, when 
a particular facility whose permit is not complying with the permit. Um, and Amanda brought up a good point, which is this is an honor system. So going back to your question, it is. So we basically provide a survey, the EPA provide either a survey or an application. We relied upon the individual or corporate entity to provide truthful information, accurate information. And the state or agency decides whether or not to issue a permit based on that. That triggers certain not only requirements in terms of following what you're saying, but also reporting requirements. Um, and it can be onerous depending on how complicated the facility is. If you're dealing with a nuclear power plant, for example, although nuclear power plants are probably regulated by a different facility, but let's say a pretty large wastewater treatment facility, uh, which will require a number of you know procedures and outflows, and depending on whether you go to the Chesapeake Bay, it may take uh, quite a number of uh, months before you get a permit. It may require some um, sort of working together with the agency. If the things that you thought were going to work are not working, for example, there are ways to address that as well. Um, I do not know how many permits are actually rejected. Uh, it's a great question. I don't know whether you have any experience on that. Well, if they're if they're rejected, they're violating the Clean Water Act. So they're seeking a permit for if it's for a future activity. What happens is like in the 404 context, you've got somebody going out to propose to develop a plot of land. Say they're going to build a um, you know a, a house or a, a building. They apply for a 404 permit if there are jurisdictional waters and they can't begin construction until they get that permit and in the 404 context i know that that was one of the biggest complaints and why initially even the um the ones who now challenge the uh WOTUS rule wanted there to be additional clarification because the permitting was taking too long it was taking years for an individual permit 404 permit uh, when you're looking at the, the big traditional POTWs and big industrial dischargers, they've had permits forever, so you're in the renewal process. So I, you know, I don't know, when you get rejected, right. then you either can't do something, but if you're already discharging, then you should have had a permit already or you've been in violation, right. yeah. Right. And you do want everybody right. who's discharging to have a permit. <laughs> right. So this you do Kathy. require a permit. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. Oh, thanks, David. Um, I just want to lob in here that there's a footnote in Rapanos that was based on a study that David Sunding, who's a professor at Berkeley, did uh, that said in 2006, and this is under the 404 permitting uh, program, not the NPDES program, uh, that a, a an individual 404 permit was costing, uh, let's see here, um, here it is. Uh, it was costing $271,596 and taking 70, 788 days mm -hmm. to get the average permit. And I'm not sure we uh, touched upon this um, uh, in great detail, but there are also a set of nationwide permits that one can apply for. And if you fall within it, this uh, reduces the time and the cost. Uh, you know, they've just issued uh, generic permits. And if you fall within the qualifications of the nationwide permit, you can reduce the cost um, uh, of that. But even the average applicant under 404, under the Rapanos decision in 2006, was estimated to spend 313 days and $28,915 on, um, on, on the nationwide permits. So there's not an insignificant um, cost in timing. And I don't have any data on um, the rejection level or acceptance level of permits. Question. Great. Thank you. Anyone else?
Hi, so um, I work at an historical research firm and will often work for law firms trying to figure out and identify like which parties were releasing pollutants into the water and like what type of chemicals they may have been releasing. So my question for you is, do you do like, does any of that historical activity matter in the work you do or are you mo mostly focus on like present day discharges? So you're looking at um, some uh, an entity that has stopped its legacy uh, pollution? Yeah, mostly yeah. we look at like, were uh, pollutants from like the 18, 1900s, and that's like been ceased for probably decades at this point. So I was wondering if that plays a role in what you do or not really. Good question. Um, it probably would not uh, be as much of an impact in the kind of work that I do in the criminal because harm is not necessarily something that we need to prove. I can see how it would um, create a problem if you're trying to make somebody liable for a pollutant um and particular cleanups which would be in a different program than the clean water act um it is though so we do consider for example if somebody's discharging and you're a down um discharger whether or not you're some some other individuals are contributing into um the same watershed and are so how does that affect the water quality standards so i think it was um Elizabeth, who mentioned this idea of whether discharges are affecting the water quality and whether we can bring in enforcement, I can see how that would make um, could be an impact because you need to address who else is polluting and what is how significant it my discharges are in comparison to others. You're up from a you know significant categorical industrial user that pollutes that sends toxics to the um, particular watershed and you're only dealing with somebody who's a much smaller polluter, perhaps only does a small amount of pH, lower pH or something like that, or then it's kind of unfair to treat this individual different uh, without considering whatever everybody else is contributing. If it's historical though, it's, I'm sure we have the analytical data uh, and it's something that the agency is probably looking at, uh, but mostly, to make sure that we don't degrade the particular watershed probably more than it, sh it should. Um, I'm sure scientists would look into those uh, in order to consider how, what kind of impact you would have because you have certain background levels. Um, but other than that, not, not in the kind of enforcement that we do because we deal with the polluters that are discharging. I mean, we sometimes, I mean, many times we do historical cases because we, bring an enforcement action, the individual stops polluting, but we still, they're still liable for those discharges that were unpermitted, knowing or negligent. Um, and then deciding what kind of fine we would address or we recommend for the judge, that may be an issue. Or a defendant can bring an issue that, Your Honor, it's unfair, you know, I do, I do not deserve a bigger fine because this watershed was already polluted. And we've had those arguments before in many cases where they say it's such a big day, it's already polluted, why is it such a big deal? And our argument is absolutely precisely because it's already polluted, it's because it's a big issue. You're, doing, you're actually doing more harm. But I can see how they can argue to the contrary, saying, you know, it's, it's unfair. Um, and then you address it with a judge ultimately, or either a consent degree or a plea agreement, depending on your civil or, or criminal arena. And I can, I'm sorry, okay. I can, um, I can give you a case study from the municipal perspective. It's uh, New York City. So they have the Gowanus Canal. It's got legacy pollutants. Right. And I'm not sure what's in there, but it's a, it's a super fun site. Right. So they're dealing with CERCLA and a different office of EPA to deal with that because they're a PRP, potentially responsible party. Right. Right. And then they're dealing with the clean water side with their combined sewer overflow right. reduction projects. Okay. And um, the requirements don't always like uh, advance the, the common purpose. So they're spending money here, spending money right. there. So that's where it would come up for uh, for cities if, if they're dealing with these legacy pollutants that they could be potentially responsible for and they'd have to then consider that as part of the circle cleanup. Right, I think that's probably the more the better context. Anybody else? Great, thank you. Okay, we'll take one more um, question from uh, the site and then we have a couple of questions online as well. Um, I. Uh, I work for um, a consultant firm that is helping a Maryland agency with complying with their um, 
NPDS, MS4 NPDS permit that's issued by the Maryland Department of Environment and approved by the EPA. So one of the requirements of their permit is um, when MDE issues a new TMDL for the state of Maryland and EPA, when EPA approves it, mm -hmm. the agency has one within one year, according to their permit, to write a plan for that TMDL. Right. So what I find difficult is part of our, um, was looking at the TMDLs, sometimes MDE um, will write their TMDLs and define their watersheds based on their own eight digit watershed system so that's how in, that's how maryland puts it each one's an eight digit mm -hmm. you know bush river is eight digit this you know and other times they'll flip and they'll do one that's written to the segments based on the chesapeake bay i believe program okay. and i'm wondering is there and i what i'm thinking is the reason why the segments were put into place that system was so all the states that are tied to the chesapeake bay tmdl could have a uniform way of referring to them Okay. Is that correct? Probably Elizabeth would know that. Okay, I, know I just that. wondered why they flip back and forth, and are, is is the is the movement to try to get maybe MD eventually maybe some of the not so much for their watersheds out like west that they don't that aren't tied to the bay necessarily, but for the ones around it, are they trying right. to go to just writing towards the segment scheme so then all the states understand versus this eight digit? Right. Yeah. It's a way of delineating it differently. Yeah, right. It, so okay. that when they're looking at the huck, when they're looking at the watershed, um, that is that is typically what I've seen, and that is the best way to do it because you're looking then at um, well, that's intrastate water body where they can look and control all the pollutant sources. With the Chesapeake Bay, you're dealing with um, you know, many states, um, tr uh, interstate waters, and so maybe they're they're just doing that for. So it's consistent with other states on Chesapeake Bay. But what I've seen is that you'd have it on a watershed basis, sort of, that that's how you would make your determinations. But Elizabeth, I don't know if you know more about how Maryland is doing there. Um, no, I'm not the pro on Maryland, unfortunately, but I will say that uh, I think that at times they do try to echo the segments as set forth in the Bay Team deal, overarching you know, requirements. But sometimes a situation can be driven by state code, like the eight-digit HUD code, if it's talking right. about uh, trading in the stormwater context, um, you know, or nutrient offsets, that kind of thing. Then um, sometimes that can be driven by a state code provision as well. In no, the end, I guess it really right. doesn't matter because what but we do is we, we yeah. take a look at the actual area, whatever's right. in that area, whether yeah. you're this watershed that you were part of an eight-digit or whether you're part of the segment, mm -hmm. what we call the right. segment shed, the, sh the right. watershed associated with the segment. Mm -hmm. It all, yeah, it all comes together. Right. But uh, what I would it's say, just interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. What I would say is, not only is a great question. I think it's something that you want to post to the Maryland and to the EPA Maryland. in a narrative way so that you can actually address the issue and they actually are responsible to and this will be sort of somewhat of a FOIA request if you will but yeah. the, the idea is that it's important for the agency to know your concerns and I think it's, an, it's a legitimate question that you should get an answer to yeah I'm just um, more curious so I might right. just, just ask them the question they'll just be like oh yeah we do it this way because of x you know right. and mm -hmm. then I'll understand right, right. it's just more of a curiosity and it, it may be that they're not looking at it because you're looking at it from a different perspective they're not looking at it from so you're, you want to have them put themselves in your shoes right. and say, hey, having to figure it wow. out. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it does, it does have meaning to you, yeah. and it should have meaning to them. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. So don't do it by good FOIA. Suggestion. Working for two state agencies, we'd rather you just call and ask yeah, the I'm question. Gonna call. Yeah, I was going to call. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. That's a good uh, suggestion. Our, our questions are always addressed. Any yeah, yeah, question would be addressed as a FOIA question. So yeah. 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 So okay. But thank you. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Um, next, we'll move on to some questions from the web. One second. All right. So, do the panelists have reflections on, uh, on or experiences with potential additional complexities of interstate water quality management initiatives, such as the Chesapeake Bay, that might also involve tribes with treatment as state designation? Okay. Uh, Elizabeth would be the one. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, we're uh, hoping that you can answer that one. This is totally unfair. I'm not there to defend myself. <laughs> um, well, we in Virginia are um, 
lucky to have a number of tribes that just were federally recognized. So I'm thinking that's why you lobbed that over to me probably. And I would say that right now, honestly, a lot of people are trying to determine what exactly that means and um, mm -hmm. how best to work with the tribes. We have two uh, tribes with res traditional reservation grounds. Um, so they are, I believe, and David could speak to this better than I, but I believe they're speaking with the EPA about the water quality permitting in those situations, but uh, separate from the state. But um, yeah, I think that uh, dealing with um, between states and tribes that have been federally recognized is going to have to be an effort that is similarly creative and flexible as it is with the interstate Chesapeake Bay Agreement. But we're just at the very beginnings of those discussions. Right. And I do believe we have um, communication with the tribes, certainly in Virginia. Um, right. I'm not familiar with what the communications are, but I'm aware that they are communicating. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, one more question from the web uh, from Jess Walker. Could you briefly elaborate on how TMDLs for pollutants are developed and then reevaluated and updated? Um, and specifically, how frequently are they updated? Good question. Yeah. Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, Actually, I don't, that's a good question. I'm pausing to think if I can pull that out of my brain. I don't know without doing a little research on how often that they do it. Um, but it has to be done periodically in the sense that, I will say this, that the waste load allocations, as I think it was David who first set out the formula, you know, the WLAs right. plus the LAs plus the margin of safety. Right. Um, and so you have, and we have that problem here in Virginia where they allocated fully the waste load allocations, for example, for the James River. And then when new development comes, that's a serious issue. How are you going to um, accommodate that? And the answer is you've got to figure out um, whether it's a, a waste load allocation trading system and a, or a retraction of old waste load allocations that aren't used. But it is capped. There is a formula. But um, the, there are other factors such as climate change that could probably change those original numbers since they would have to be revisited periodically. But I'm not sure what the schedule is. I know for the... No, for the well, Long Island Sound TMDL, it's five years, but um, but that was that was uh, developed in 2000, and EPA has not yet actually reviewed and revised it. So there's no there's no real. They say that they'll uh, review it every five years, which right. it would be a good practice, uh, but there's no real mechanism to force EPA to do it. Right, and EPA holds, obviously has the enforcement or the oversight. Um, I want to say there's a provision about two years that you have to provide in advance of when the TMDL is going to be you know, implemented, but um, I don't know that there's a specific provision on the how many years would it be in and how it's revised. Uh, I was trying to look uh, at the particular section is 303, I believe, of the of the act, and I don't remember. I would have, I don't remember out of the top of my head. Um, but EPA does have a duty to approve and disapprove, and I'm guessing that trigger certain. Uh, certainly, if they approve it, it will certainly bring some form of reapproval process, which I'm guessing is probably between two and three or uh, five years at the most. Same as the MPDS yeah, permits. Yeah, right. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for your insightful questions. Um, if we don't have any more questions from the audience, um, we'll move on to Sam with our closing remarks. Um, last call for questions? No? Okay, great. Okay. Thank you to our audience for joining us today and for your great questions. We hope you will continue to think and learn about the foundation and developments of the Clean Water Act. You can stay up to date with our summer school series on our website at eli.org. And next Tuesday, we will be diving into the Clean Air Act, so sign up today. An enormous thank you to our fantastic panel, David, Kathy, Amanda, and Elizabeth. Your vast knowledge on these topics has been fascinating and informative, and we're so glad you joined us today. Thank you all again, and have thank a wonderful you. afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.